we threw the ashes and they all came back at us with like the wind and it was like it was this moment like the three of us just kind of like cracked up like crying laughing it was the most cathartic therapeutic bonding thing that could have happened as if she was there like wanting us to like laugh together as a family and like be okay and so i guess personally my experience is laughter is the best medicine and it's helped us bond because we all know it hurts and we've cried and it sucks we can live in that or we can like we can try to like laugh and like know that there is life to be led and we do it for her and she wants us to be happy and not stay in that darkness so personally i think comedy is essential dying of laughter <laughs> Not funny. My mom has stage four cancer in her bones and in her breast. My dad's disease was 15 years, he died of ALS. I made a podcast about death, seemed like the thing to do. And if you're sad by all of this, well, you're gonna die too. Happy week, all. Hope this finds you as well as possible and that you had an enjoyable ish Thanksgiving if you celebrate here in America or wherever you are. I Made the creamed corn. It was delicious. You know that recipe that has like tons of milk and cream and butter and sugar and just tastes better than anything else you've ever had? It was that. And my sister made these brie bites with puff pastry, brie, and fig jam. What? Anyways, that already feels like years ago at this point, even though it was last week. But my high low for this week, my low is just feeling the holiday sluggishness that comes with the pandemic. And it just feels like I'm missing that holly jolly pep in my step that I sometimes have. But that's okay. Just being honest, I am participating in the Modern Loss Holiday Gift Swap, which is a gift swap where you fill out a form saying who you lost and they pair you with someone else who has lost someone anywhere in the country. Then you get each other gifts around $30 each. And I participated in the Fatherless Father's Day gift swap earlier this year and had a really good experience. So I'm looking forward to that. Just sharing a little holiday joy in that way. My high of this week, I went behind the scenes of a BuzzFeed project that I directed remotely, produced, and also edited because as... I've mentioned on here before, I taught myself to edit this year, so that's been crazy. And it was about women's vibrators. And this video sold so many vibrators. I can't even explain how shocked I was. I hate when people say they can't say certain things, but I don't know. I'm not really supposed to say how many, but I'll just say it's thousands and thousands and lots of vibrators and they say that 90% of directing is casting I totally agree with that because I got to work with this great talent who I met earlier this year at BuzzFeed named May Elridge and she just crushed it and it was so cool to have her bring the vision to life that I had been thinking of and her and her girlfriend tried different vibrators and reviewed them and it was funny and fun and I got to add music and edit it to, to have this whole comedic feel and it was just really powerful and it actually was BuzzFeed's number one video in sales. What does that even mean? Should I direct real commercials guys? I don't know. Anyways, I'm excited about that. Anyways, poor Max who's probably listening to this and being like, wait, where's my interview? I cannot wait for today's interview with Max Adler. You know him as Dave Karofsky on Glee. You remember the bully, the homophobic slushy throwing guy who was this controversial, amazing figure that it couldn't be nicer in real life. I was like, Dave, is that you? My gosh. No slushies were thrown in the making of this interview. You also know him as the controversial buzzed about character Tank in Switched at Birth. He's also worked with Woody Allen and Cafe Society, Clint Eastwood and Sully, and was recently a lead in the film Mope, which came out at Sundance 2019. Most recently, he was in Trial of the Chicago 7, which he also co-executive produced, which just came out on Netflix. I admittedly have not seen it yet. I cannot wait. It's a very powerful and important story, and the fact that Max is in it is just so fantastic and speaks to his talent. So this guy has done it all. And he's also heavily involved with GLAD, the Trevor Project, and the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Today, we are opening up about the loss of Max's mother when Max was in high school. And while she ultimately died of a heart attack, Max's mother did combat Lyme disease as well as muscular dystrophy. So we will be discussing the complexities of that and what that meant for Max growing up. And he was 17 when his mom died I was 19 when my dad died, and despite having completely different loss stories and experiences, it was really powerful getting to connect with Max 
in a sense that it was generally around the same time of both of our lives. Max is just so impressive. He's one of those guys that when you do get to talk to him, you're like, wow, I understand where your success stems from because he's larger than life. He couldn't be kinder, throwing out compliments and kind words and wittyisms and jokes. And I just so appreciated getting to really dive deep into the complexities of his grief story as well as his career. Normally for these interviews, I do go into more depth about one or the other, not necessarily planning to, but it it tends to lean one way or the other. With this one, we really explored both. So it was so hard to edit it down. I wanted to keep everything. I did keep most of it. It's about an hour 30, but it's it's really worth it. And I spent a lot of time just like futzing with the little audio to make it as great as possible because I'm just so passionate about it. And as you guys know, my in-person interviews are always even higher audio quality, which of course this year has not occurred, but it is very high considering the Zoom situation. So huge thank you to Max for coming on and shout out to our mutual friend, Rochelle Meese, who connected us. Rochelle is a hysterical comedian herself and she wrote Bachelor the Musical, a parody on, yes, The Bachelor. And it's so, so good. I can't wait for live things to come back. So hopefully more people can see it because she's just a powerhouse comedic talent. And they both went to Horizon High School, which ironically, my boyfriend also went to Horizon High School. My boyfriend's a few years behind them, so they didn't overlap, but there's just a lot of things overlapping here. Also, I interned for Glee Casting folks, UDK, and Glee was Max's big break. So I just felt like there was all these overlapping little fun tidbits like that. Enough about me. Enough about this intro. On to the episode. You'll love it. Max, I'm obsessed with you. Can't wait to run into you in person one day. Let's do this. So, Max, thank you for being here. You are so talented, and I'm really excited that our friend Rochelle connected us. I'm thrilled, Rochelle. Rochelle Meese, amazing comedian, amazing gal, amazing person, amazing human, generous, hilarious, smart, uh, yeah, I went to high school with her. We were in show choir together. We were in jazz choir. We we toured around the nation to different cities competing. It was real life glee. And here we are, yeah, friends for half of our lives. And uh, and I'm here today because of her and you. So uh, shout out to Rochelle and shout out to her bachelorette, uh, bachelor musical. So good. Brilliant. And I actually do watch The Bachelor as a guilty pleasure. And so, yes. uh, but you don't, you don't even have to like it to love the musical. It's just... It's just so smart and so witty and so brilliant. So anyone who gets a chance to see it, um, see it. Don't miss it. For those that don't know, do you mind sharing a little bit about your upbringing and what brings you here today? Talking about your mom, who did you grow up with and where? And what was your childhood like before your fame and before your mom was no longer here? Fame? Is there fame? I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to throw some your way. I, got, I did something right to get on this podcast. You're a known entity. That counts. I'm, I love it. I'll take it. I'm an entity. Mission accomplished. Uh, let's go home. Um, I was born in New York, Queens, New York, uh, to my dad and mom, who uh, were both teachers living in a small little like three floor walk up, one bedroom. And they wanted to just get me out of there because it's a hard place to raise a kid. And so they followed their parents had retired in Arizona, where uh, I get now more than ever why you'd want to go there because it's beautiful. I had had the best of both worlds because there was this very East Coast, Italian, New York, you know, culture and accent. And so I was surrounded by that and that kind of upbringing. But in Arizona, which is, you know, a whole other world and, you know, the West and, uh, you know, cowboys and different politics. And so I kind of had this really cool juxtaposition of cultures uh, every day growing up. Um, and then when I was six, my little baby bro, uh, Jake, was born, which was awesome. I had been asking for a little sibling, and I wanted one so bad. Did all the sports growing up, you know, baseball, soccer, football, basketball. And then, like, uh, middle school, I was, like, I was always into performing and acting. I, done, I did, like, Jesus Christ Superstar when I was, like, 10 in the community. Like, I was always, like, you know, dabbling, doing little summer camps uh, for, like, singing actors and, you know, things like that, Guys and Dolls. Oh, who are you in Guys and Dolls? One of the... Who's the guy? I don't even know his name anymore. He was like seventh grade. Nathan Detroit. No, no, no. I wasn't Nathan or Sky. Guy Masterson. Okay. I know Sky Masterson. Nathan Detroit. I know. I was the guy, you know, in the beginning, that's like, I got the horse right here. His name is Paul Revere. And he's the guy that says if the weather's that. And I did that actually with Rochelle. Um, 
So there was love. Did, yeah, that's so, so crazy. Anyway, so enter high school. And I just because I'm built like a football player, I assumed like you watch all the Freddie Prinze movies growing up. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm gonna have like a Letterman jacket and like be an awesome high school football varsity badass. And then my, my dad ha was a soccer college badass in his day and busted up his knees, had like five knee surgeries, knee replacement, like the whole, you know, his dream was like shattered, became a teacher. Um, a special ed teacher, which also was a big part of my upbringing, just watching him do that and, you know, work with those kids and those families and just have a whole understanding and empathy for a whole other, you know, lifestyle. Amazing. Yeah, it really was. Uh, and so he told me, he kind of sat down and was like, look, like, are you really going to be a football player? Like, are you really, are you really considering this? Because like, I happen to think you're a pretty good actor and, and, you know, mom was there and, and she agreed and was like, I think you should just pursue this. Like, you know, you actually could do something with it. I was like, hmm, okay, well, that sounds, uh, that sounds good to me. So I didn't really do sports after high school and I just threw myself into like choir and drama, did everything, you know, drama club, student government, you know, show choir, jazz choir, classical choir, just big arts guy. And yeah, so that was high school. And then a couple things happened. It was like, I and Rochelle, uh, my fellow Horizon Husky knows as well, but Garrett Hedlund, pretty big actor now, uh, an unknown entity, you would say, uh, went to our high school and we were in choir together and like, you know, room together for like choir retreats. And he, very good looking guy, so I could never be that, but like, he just looks like he's, you know, like a movie star. And he would go back and forth. He would just miss school and be like, where's Garrett? Oh, he drove to LA. He's auditioning for something awesome. I was like, whoa. Junior year, he booked Troy with Brad Pitt and Orlando Bloom. And all of a sudden, like, we were in school and he was in Malta, like, shooting, like, sword fighting scenes, like, on cliffs and, like, hanging out with these guys. And so that was, I was like, the first time that I was like, oh my gosh, like, is this possible? Like, is this actually, like, a tangible dream? Like, he was just sitting right here and now he's in Hollywood. Because at that point, I didn't think it was really going to happen. I was just like, I was just going to go to school at ASU for broadcast journalism. And I was like, mm, this is the second best, like, I, you know, a script, I'm on TV, like I have wardrobe, but there's like hair and makeup. It's the same kind of thing. Um, but when that happened, I was like, huh. And then my mom had said, like, you know, you don't need a degree to have a career in the arts. Um, and because she was a dancer in her 20s uh and then she had hodgkins and had to get surgery and so then her dream uh you know ended as well so both both my parents had these dreams you know athlete dancer and then both became teachers so I, that was also a big part of my upbringing of like oh well you know the dreams don't really happen but when both of them kind of had my back and she was the one that kind of said why why even go to college like just get out there and like go for it you can always go to college and i was like mom you're crazy like you don't do that like everyone's going to laugh at me you don't just not you don't just get out and not get a degree and like you don't just move out and pursue your dreams that's nuts then senior year she passed away and so what that all was was that she had Lyme disease uh, which when I was four, she took me like just uh, walking around in like our, our backyard with like, like a wash behind our house with, you know, cacti and plants and everything. And I was like in a little, uh, you know, one of those little scooters that you can ride around in. And she was walking and like rubbed up against some plant and a tick bit her. And she had this crazy oh. rash. And this was like 1990. So she went to the doctors and was like, what the hell? Um, and at that point, it wasn't really known. Um, and so no, it was kind of this mystery thing where they didn't really know what it was and didn't do anything about it. Yeah. So it got worse. And then that just basically depletes you of your energy, your immune system. Uh, there's so many um, you know, symptoms and, and effects to Lyme disease. And in addition to that, she had muscular dystrophy, uh, which I'm also like a big advocate for. I do a lot of charity work with, with the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Um, specifically, it's called FSH, muscular dystrophy, which is the fascio humeral, which is what my mom had, which is like the face, shoulders, and like upper body, and their muscles just deteriorate. You can't use, you can't whistle, you know, it's hard to talk, hard to eat, hard to reach for things. So between mu muscular dystrophy and Lyme disease, she was in and out of doctors all the time, on meds all the time, on pills, and they were just so focused on that and keeping her healthy that apparently they missed uh, the fact that like three of her four like arteries, you know, valves were clogged going into her heart. And out of nowhere, middle of the night, um, she passed away.
And so that was obviously devastating because it was one of those like a Tuesday night and, you know, we just said good night, like uh, kind of like always, but here's there, then there's this weird thing too, where there's still like a little, little bit of like a mysterious circumstance around the whole thing mm. because she was very down in the dumps and very, you know, she had her dark moments that she wasn't able to like live her dreams and like be there for us as much as, you know, she wanted because when dancing stopped, she, all she wanted to do was be like an awesome mom and be there for me and my brother. And her, when she knew she was sick, she was like, I just want to live long enough to see my little brother like graduate high school. So she didn't because he, you know, he, he was 11 when she passed. And so she was fighting for that. And she had her moments when she was like, she just couldn't be the mom she wanted to be. And she would tell us but she, she like that she wrote letters to us that she contemplated suicide, that if she, wow. like, she had a catheter that was like all of her medicine would go into her body um and she was like you know i could just like put air in there and it would like stop my heart and we're like holy shit mom like don't do that like what the fuck are you talking Wait, about she said that to you yeah yeah wow it was uh yeah we had that we were like aware of like that that could happen you know she just had her you know very emotional kind of breakdowns which is understandable you know just just the frustration oh. the you know whatever it is, she just kind of would have her moments where she would just kind of snap and it would all kind of come out and we were either we, we would overhear it or you know she would tell us directly but that was the thing so that night it was weird because it's like you know you look back and in hindsight it's one of those like huh because you know it's, it's the thing where you're like hey good night mom like you know i love you see you tomorrow and she would just kind of like you know look at me and she was just like hey like i love you i was like okay great like love you too good night and she's like hey like i love you and i was like okay like what the fuck like that we you know and then my brother said he experienced the same thing like she went in bed and like kind of like cuddled with him and like read him a book and kind of like stayed there a longer time than usual and so anyway so yeah it was uh so that night um like middle of the night my brother woke me up and was like the fire engines are here and there's like paramedics in the room like mom's dying and i was like what are you talking about like mom's not dying and it's like three in the morning we, we rushed into the room and and there yeah she was like on the floor and we see the paramedics like trying to revive her you know tubes and oxygen tanks and everything just trying to you know start her heart again and we're watching this and another firefighter swoops in and, like moves like grabs us by the chest and he's like get these kids out of here and like kicks us out of the room so me and my brother are like freaking out you know and and again he's like mom's dying i was like no she's not like that doesn't that doesn't happen like you know that that's dope she'll be fine rushed her to the hospital we followed her with my dad and lo and behold, yeah, they were not able to revive her. And they basically just told us in this like cold hospital room that, uh, you know, she's gone. So that was pretty devastating. And yeah. so then, you know, the cause of death on record is heart attack, which, uh, you know, her brother, her best friend, like every, everyone says like, there's no way she would have done anything to hurt herself because all she wanted to do was see my brother graduate high school. It's just like a fluke freak thing, but you know, us just being her sons just wonder if like if she just had enough and, and did something to induce it and we'll never know and it's mm -hmm. weird to talk about you know but I don't know it's kind of a mystery but either way you know she's she's gone and so that was a um a very decisive moment in my in my life it's one of those things where like you kind of talk about like living for the day yeah and like you know just be present and, like seize the you know carpe diem and all that uh, but it takes on a different meaning when like one second everything is the world as you know it and then you know you wake up a few hours later and the whole world is upside down and like you're shattered but like everyone else is just going about business as usual and you're like hey like my mom died like sh what, what the hell like you know isn't everything like closed down like what's going on yeah. yeah and it's just like business as usual and school's in session and I'm like whoa like so it was a pretty uh a pretty shocking experience and so it was at that moment when I was like well then fuck plan B, like, I'm not going to college. I'm just gonna go do this for her and like, go make it count. And like every day I'm just gonna bust ass and like, I better, I better hit, you know, hit that dream for her um, because it's yeah. what she wanted and it's what she encouraged. And so, uh, so that was it. So I graduated high school, worked all summer as a valet, saved up some money and uh, not much, $3,000, which I thought was a lot then, but it goes in about four days in LA. Yeah, yeah, literally. <laughs> and, and then, uh, and then moved out here. And um, and another really good friend of mine, who also a chorus friend from Horizon High School um, named Petrina, um, she had a place out here. She was going to the Fashion Institute. And so I stayed with her for like a month to try to you know, figure everything out. And then my other good buddy, who Rochelle also knows, uh, Danny, who I did my first play ever with in middle school. Shout out to the first play, baby. First play, Night of the Living Beauty Pageant. 
no one's ever heard about it again, but that's what it was. And we were, we were the leads and he moved out here and we lived together. And that was, it, it was kind of like that, you know, the Ben Affleck, Matt Damon dream of like, you know, it was, it was like the two of us, like, Hey, like, let's, let's do this. And so, uh, so it was, so that was it. And that's how I got to LA and we we're like, let's you know every weekend friends would come out and stay with us and you know go to the beach and hang out and we just we would you know work and i i valeted did restaurant stuff he did restaurant stuff and that's uh so that takes you up to my la move i love it thank you for sharing that and is it true you had put in the form before that about getting fired from the valet job, just since you just mentioned from stealing toilet paper and getting fired by giving away a muffin to a woman who just found out she had cancer. That, so that, true. Can you tell? Both of those things are true. About that? Yeah, I can. Yeah, because, well, so I was, I was at the Marriott, uh, very big chain, billions of dollars, and I had like zero dollars. And so there was, I just, I just discovered this like ginormous vault of like toilet paper and paper towels and tissues that would stock you know the 3,000 rooms so every once in a while I would uh I would just kind of stock up what, what the apartment needed I would I would get some yeah. toilet paper I would get some paper towels you know things like that because it's like every dollar counted yeah well the Marriott won't miss it like this is makes this makes a difference to me being like overdrawn or not and then same with my buddy um Danny who you know he, he worked at a restaurant and he'd bring all you know all the leftovers or the, or the screwed up orders and that would be like the food we ate, you know, we just tried to survive. But one day I went into work and, uh, and they're like, Hey, like, don't clock in yet. The manager wants to see you upstairs. And I was like, all right. And so there I, I, I walked in and he was like, have a seat. And I was like, okay. And he's like, can you explain this? And he reaches over the desk and passes me like an eight by 10 printed out shot of like a security camera still of me, like holding like these like six rolls of toilet paper and like going out the door. Oh my God. Mortifying. And I was just like, well, I can't explain that. Uh, I'm broke. I'm not making enough in tips. And I tried to save, you know, 12 bucks or whatever. And uh, it's pretty embarrassing. And I'm really sorry. Um, but that's what happened. And I'm like, I can, I can return them. I, I can, I can go get some now and, and bring it back. And he was like, look, like I get it. Like he was a big, he was a big advocate of mine, but um, you know, he's like, come you know, word is from upstairs that, uh, you know, theft is theft and they don't know how long you've done it or what else you've stolen and you're gone. Like they gotta, we gotta fire you. Wow. And I was like, I was like, I was like, this is terrifying. I'm like, please don't fire me. Like I won't be able to, like, obviously I'm broke. Like if I get fired, I'm really screwed. Like, don't do this to me. Like I'll, I'll do, I'll make it up. Like, just don't pay me for a week. Like I'll, I'll borrow money from my dad, whatever. But it was too late and uh and i was fired and that call back home to my dad was like really devastating so i'm just like dad like not only you know because when i moved out i was like I'll, I'll give it two years and if i don't make it in two years maybe i'll go back to college you know um and then i was like oh this is good this might take a little bit longer than like two years you know so yeah like seven or eight months in i'm like dad um not only like am i like a huge uh I'm not a movie star yet but i also just got fired from my day job for stealing toilet paper you know and it was just like silence and i'm just like oh man <laughs> so that was that that was that that was pretty bad and then i did a couple you know restaurant gigs one restaurant one when i was at macaroni grill and i had a callback for a commercial that was like a long wait but it was to work with the american history x director great I just felt really good about it and I tried to get my shift covered and I couldn't and I just called them and I was like I am not coming in I have this call back and I'm like I'm I kind of like told myself when I moved out like I'm never going to miss acting opportunities for like a right. job because I can get restaurant jobs anywhere right didn't show up got fired but did book the commercial and that's what got me sag and so lesson learned yes it was okay. a sweet, sweet victory. So I did yes. that. And then the other one, the other rest, and then so then the next restaurant, because the commercial didn't pay enough, called me over for the rest of my life, like I thought it would, right. um, was, yeah, I was working and there was kind of like a, like a little bakery section and there was like a regular who came in, this woman who's always so sweet. We'd have, you know, how's, how's it going, honey? Like, how's the career? And I'd ask about her family or grandkids. And one day she came in and she was just like, so down in the dumps and just like, unlike any energy she had ever brought in before and she would always get like you know like a vanilla latte and banana nut muffin it was like always her thing and so uh she basically told me that she had just come from the doctor and found out she has like breast cancer and it's like really bad and really scary and she started like getting teary-eyed and emotional and i was like oh my gosh you know i'm so sorry and i was there for her and at the end i was like you know what just it's on me like you know just just to have it enjoy it like get out of here you know have a have a good one 
Yeah. But uh, yeah, the bus boy saw that, reported me to the manager. No. He said oh. I was giving away free pastries and the manager was like, you know, is this true? And I was like, yeah, but it's like, you throw them away at the end of the day. Like I, I literally, like, that's our, our instruction. Like at the end of the day, like we throw away croissants and muffins and cookies, like in the, in the trash. Like you don't even give them to homeless people, which we tried to set up before. You literally, like, you literally throw them in the garbage can. I gave them to someone who just found out she has cancer and she comes in all the time. Uh, and again, fired. I cannot believe you were fired for the muffin. The toilet paper is like a little corporate, still ridiculous, but it's like Marriott is so corporate, but a muffin at a restaurant, come on. I, I said the same thing. I was like, I can't believe it. But, but to tell these stories now is yeah. so full circle. And I did do like, a, like an interview once for a magazine, like Zoe magazine. And they did a photo shoot with me with like toilet paper, which was also an awesome full circle, like F you moment. Even though I'm, I can't advocate theft. Like I did steal, that is wrong. Like I, w I was in the wrong. Yeah. Sure, but like, I didn't think I'd be fired for it. I thought there was a way to like apologize or, you know, make up for it, but that's true. But, uh, but just like one of those weird, again, like a full circle, like just like I was, you know, I was in one spot and then you like, kind of like wake up and you're in this whole other realm and, uh, and uh, just life is just crazy. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing those moments because I feel like people who are in the grind and getting fired from those jobs at the time, I've also been, have similar situations from like my starter jobs of, you know, it just doesn't quite work out. You miss for that callback and they're like, Hey, it's the third time. And you're like, please, please, please. However, it's so devastating at the time, and yet the perspective is helpful. So if anyone's recently been fired from a job in the pandemic or something, I'm glad they can like hear from your story and see where you are now. Yeah, I, I agree. I, th I think when you get fired, it's, it's obviously devastating and mortifying and so scary. But, um, you know, there are, there are other jobs. There's ways to figure it out, but it's, it's hard and it's scary. And it's still scary and hard now. I mean, yeah, I've been yeah. fired. Here's here's a, here's another crazy fire story, and I have in a restaurant. This was this was an indie movie that I auditioned for and booked, and I was like uh, supposed to be like the owner of this diner, and I don't know. I kind of got like inspired to be like, oh, because like, he was kind of like he was like a di the owner of a diner, but everyone would come in and kind of tell him their stories of how this night went down. Mm. Guy was like kind of like half like investigator, like he wanted to figure out what happened that night, but also like half diner owner. And so I just had this random like thought and I was just like, what if like, he's always got like a toothpick and he's kind of like this like old school, like, you know, like law and order, like detective, but like, you know, there's toothpicks in the diner, whatever. So like, I didn't even meet the director yet because it was just an audition with casting and like, you know, wardrobe had contacted me to get my sizes and all that. And I said to them, I was like, you know, by the way, um, you know, if you can have like some toothpicks or something there, like standing by when I show up on my first day, like, that would be awesome because, like, there's something I kind of, like, want to do and, like, try it out. But I'm like, you know, if you need me to bring my own in, like, let me know. I just figured you'd want to, like, you know, correspond, like, the look or the wood or what, the rights, whatever. And <laughs> hours later, I'm, like, I'm in a movie theater. I'm sitting back when you can go to movie theaters. And uh, I was watching a movie and I missed, like, I don't know, three calls from my, my managers and agents. And I get out of the movie and call them back. And he was like, dude, one word for you. Toothpick. I was like, what? What? You've been fired from the movie because the director thinks like you're high maintenance and you were like demanding toothpicks. I was like, what? Like, what? Oh, I'm like, wardrobe, wardrobe called me and asked me like what, what I needed and like my sizes. And like, I was just like, if you can have toothpicks, that would be great. And if not, I'll bring my own. I'm like, I don't even understand like what, what's happening right now. And the director was like, oh, you're too high maintenance. Like you're making demands, like you're fired. And I was replaced. I was replaced on a movie. So, wow. and I was shocked about that. So yeah, crazy, crazy things have happened. Oh my goodness. I'm glad you can laugh about it now. I mean, that's, that seems extreme. They still had to pay me because they fired me like the day up. So it was kind of a win-win actually, because I still got that. And uh, I didn't have to work with someone who thought I was high maintenance, which like, I'm, I was just like, I was like, I've collaborated with so many amazing people. And like, we do that. Like, you talk about things like the tell the story the best, you know, and, and what you want visually. And it's so weird. Like I couldn't even ask a question without getting fired. So oh. I guess for the best, but uh, yeah, some weird things in my ears. Yeah, man. Tricky things 
happen for sure. Oh, I was, I worked in events at the Academy years and years ago. And like, yeah. sometimes I would just greet people in the garage and some people, I, sometimes I would like pass out muffins or whatever. And then, you know, oh, too many muffins, huh? Too soon. <laughs> yeah. Literally like, muffins, just the actually. Knife, don't you, yeah. Okay. Um, Did they have toothpicks on them too? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally, they probably did. And eventually was let go because missed too many things. And and then I was so devastated at the time because I got to be a seat filler at the Oscars. And I was like, if I can't be a seat filler at the Oscars, like my life will be like ruined. And now I look back, I'm like, well, this is also very like wishful thinking. But I'm like, what if one day I was like the girl in the garage and then came back in the way that I actually wanted to be and was, you know, invited or there for another reason? That, w- that would be a beautiful story. It's not one right now, but hey, that's yes. No, but, but, it, but it will be. And what a beautiful thing. And how nice will you be to those seat fillers and people passing you muffins? You know, and that's that's the big thing I've seen is like the empathy from the other side of like any like major assholes I've worked with on, on shows or movies. I feel like it's always like a thousand percent of the time that they've never struggled. Like they've never had a day job. They've never known the the other side of things and like how bad it is. Or they've never done like theater and understand there's like a cast and a crew and everyone works together. Like they're just like, I'm the star and everyone like is lucky I'm here. And, but I think it comes from like an insecurity really. But I mean, yeah, yeah most people that like I, I jive with the best on, on sets are all people like us that have like I'm been the- in the shit and like know, know what it very well could be and know what it has been. But yeah, I'm with, I think I get it where it's like, when all you're looking for is validation, and like someone to tell you like, hey, like you're talented, you're awesome, like you're good enough, you're hired. And then like, yeah, you get fired from like restaurant ballet. It's like, why? Like, I'm not even, I can't even do that right. Like, yeah, it's like your whole right. image of yourself is like, what am I? Like, I thought I could succeed. Can I not? Like, does the world think I'm just like some loser? And so, yeah, it, it definitely, you know, affects you. It's like, how do you go to an audition the next day being like, I just got fired, you know, like, it's just, it's really, it, it doesn't, it does a number on you. You know, it's, it's brutal. For sure. Absolutely. It's so devastating at the time when really it's like there's something there. Like the people getting fired from these jobs, it's like it's because you're, you know, you were you were meant to do Glee and then and the next thing and like you weren't meant to be there for, you know, years and years and years. But then I also know some wonderful people who are also very talented that, you know, for some reason are at those jobs for years and years. And that's not to say it can't work out. And it's like for a reason. You know, and the bosses can see it too. They can see the ones that are like not, they just somehow know that you're not like in it for the long haul at these jobs. They're like, oh, you want to do this other thing. Do you think you're better than me? Like that's the attitude like that I got like macaroni grill or those restaurants was was like, you know, they didn't didn't understand like how I could want to do anything else, but like deliver plates of food to mean people, you know? Um, And yeah, so it was like, well, no, like I'm just doing this to like, pay my rent but I have uh, other dreams that I want to accomplish but yeah it's uh it was rare that I had bosses that understood that and then but then you know the empathetic side is like who knows what their dreams were that led them to that point and like what frustrations they're encountering or battling now or in the past and so it's like is there something psychologically there where like you know who knows who knows but here we are that's amazing hey popping in quickly to recommend my new virtual therapy company that I'm obsessed with. I started doing therapy online virtually with this company, BetterHelp, H-E-L-P. And I was super against doing virtual therapy because I was like, that's weird. And the whole point is to connect in person. But I decided to give it a try. And I don't know what else to say besides I cannot recommend it enough. Everyone is a licensed professional therapist. And something I like about it is that All these therapists have been doing virtual therapy before COVID. And if you use code DOL, you'll get 10% off your first month. Betterhelp.com slash DOL. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash DOL, like dying of laughter, DOL. I couldn't be more proud to partner with them and to recommend them. I personally use it. I personally love it. And I hope you do too. These are life lessons that it's like... You know, it's something interesting. And what you're saying about like who you relate with on sets, I always, I always find it so interesting just to go there for one moment and then we'll go back to your grief story. But people on, on sets and successful people, you know, some of my friends that are killing it that never did any theater really interest me. I'm like, wow, like you, 
you never did like a play or like high school plays and you know so many of us did but so many people didn't and I'm like whoa how did you even know how to do all this without that foundation you know it interests me I, I do it is interesting and, and the big yeah the big difference I've seen is that someone who's done theater I feel like respects and understands and is curious about everybody on set because you know in theater you're like we need you to build that set and bring that prop and get the microphone working and have that jacket ready to like take off and put on like it's everybody is equal and everybody counts to tell the story for the audience like right now like we're in this together and like if they're not waiting in the wings like you're late and the whole thing is derailed but on the set I feel like, yeah, people who've done theater get that. And you're like, oh, awesome. Like, you know, thank you, like, Mr. Sound Guy and, you know, Mr., uh, you know, whatever, boom operator and wardrobe and makeup and everything. But I feel like people who have not done that, yeah, it's just like everyone is here for the actors. Because to the world, that's what it is. Like, the world, you know, you watch right. a show or movie, and it's like the top three or four actors are doing, you know, the press junkets and this and that. But, like, no one else really gets to be the hero unless it's, like, the Oscars or Emmys. And most people, you know, are are fast forwarding or or not as into, uh, you know, who the best editor is in their betting pool. Um, so yeah, there's there's to me, it's like it's all glorified, and like we need everyone. And then even the other way, editing like that. So many of my performances have just been better because of the editor. And I'm like, damn, like nice job with that cut. Like that looks great. Like I I didn't even do that but they make me look awesome. So it really is just this collaborative group team effort. You are so correct in editing, just to say for one second, this is about you. I don't want to talk about myself, but no, just editing since you brought it up. My new life is I'm producing content for BuzzFeed that I'm in, and I'm, as of a couple weeks ago, editing my own stuff it's super cool and empowering because I'm like cool the video is me and now I can make it look how I want and I'm like oh my god the edit takes me like three days for a four yeah. minute video it's yeah. so hard I'm I like know. I don't want to edit this it's so hard so shout out to editors they are the most amazing people ever I'm like I never want to do this because they, they have to match first of all congratulations to you on your BuzzFeed job that's amazing and I can't wait to watch and see all the content so you are so nice. <laughs> um, and secondly, yes, because it, it's like, it's one of the few jobs, I feel like, as an editor, this is just a whole podcast about editing. But, but seriously, quick side note is that they have to master the creative part and the technical part because they have to decide, like, you know, which takes, you know, and which emotions kind of, like, run through the, like, the, the through line and tell the story the best and have the most impact. But then, like, you know, the technical part of, like, editing the exact millisecond and splicing that together with that reaction and this reaction, making sure all the continuity is the same, take after take. Like, that's a great, that's a great job that, again, like, some actors I've worked with that have not done theater don't even know the editor's name. And I'm just like, this is a disaster. There's the cut you write, the cut you shoot, and the cut you edit. <laughs> and it's three different cuts. Yeah. Yeah, oftentimes what we shoot. Because, you know, like, people are like, oh, do you watch your stuff? You're like, do you watch your stuff? I was like, I do, but like, it's not like I'm studying myself. It's more just like, I'm so curious to see what the final result looks like. Cause like, I know my experience on set that day, but then like I watch and it's like, it's always educational to be like, huh, like, wow, they went with that, like that take or that reaction or that. And I was like, it's just, I learned something every time watching, uh, right. Like where it goes from the day of shooting to what the audience sees. And it's never, you know, what you think it'll be. Totally. Whereas theater, it is what it is. Like it literally what you prep is what you will receive pretty much what the audience is going to get. And shout out to all the theater kids out there because theater is, theater is yeah. hard. Do you ever feel like, well, your situation, you've done so many wonderful roles with meaty, cool storylines. Sometimes I'm like, how did I get here? Like, I'll have a few lines on a show and it, I'm trying to rehearse it and make it perfect. And I'm like, I used to like do 90 minute plays talking every scene and now it's like a big deal to do this one scene. I'm like, how did I get here? Theater's hard. <laughs> do you ever yeah, I do feel like- that way this morning, honestly, because I had an audition. Maybe I'll get it. So I don't even want to like trash talk what show it is. Okay. It's, it's, it's a pretty big show and like, um, you know, their fifth season and the part is like two and a half pages. And I'm like busting ass on this audition and yeah, like part of, there, there's like an entourage, which is, uh, you know, if for anyone who doesn't know, show on HBO about an actor and all of his friends and like they made it big. 
And Johnny Drama is like the brother of the movie star who is like, kind of like me, like, you know, a working actor, but like a known entity, but yes. not a huge star. And he has like this great line where he's like, you know, like, I've done, you know, five TV shows and, you know, 16 movies and, you know, this and that. And like, and still they make me sing for my supper. And I was like, man, like, I just so resonate with that. Cause it's like, man, like, I've done like, you know, it's like, yeah, six years on Glee, three years on Switched at Birth. I've worked with, you know, Woody Allen, Clint Eastwood, Aaron Sorkin. And I'm like, and really, like, you still need to see that I can do, like, these two pages for this show that, like, I probably won't get. And so there is that mentality of, like, still, like, does this end? But it doesn't. And then, and back in the day, like, when I went to all these, like, SAG, uh, you know, Q&As, uh, Ryan Gosling, who's, like, one of my idols, was there and talking about, like, how he hates auditioning. And it's, like, such a shit process because it's not at all, like, what it'll be like on set. But his whole point was just, like, but what else are they going to do? There it really is no other way to know that that person can do that unless they see it. So it's like, yeah. until you come up with some other magical solution, it kind of is what it is. And I was like, okay. So like then was like my, the mind shift of like, just embrace it because like, that's so true. Like you can't, you can't fight it. Like this is the system and like probably the best system. So you just got to like own it and figure it out and like master it. But yeah, I do feel like that for sure. But also shout out to theater kids because I do feel like theater just uh more people need to do theater you know there's like a camaraderie there's an understanding there's a compassion there's like no matter you know the race economic status like everyone's equal everyone depends on everyone to hit their marks say their lines know their cues and i was like man if the whole world did theater like we'd be a little bit better i think we'd all you know work together a little more and like understand like we're all in this together and we all want the same thing like just get over your shit stop stop it just get over your shit. That's all we all have to do. Just get over our shit. And what what a world we could be. Amen. 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 If why we... isn't the next, yeah, why don't they run with that slogan? Get over right? Your shit. Okay, let's go back. I, I feel like I could like talk shop about this like all day. I'm like, oh wait, my podcast also is about grief. So I'm going to go back for a second, although I'm, and we'll jump back here. So back to high school and yeah. your mom, that was you know, a very profound time to be in high school. There's all these things going on. I'm curious how your grief has shifted from when you were in high school to your experience with grief today. Wow, that's a deep, great question. Shifted is an interesting word. I feel like it just kind of like planted itself in me and like shaped everything that I am. I feel like it was really odd in high school and it causes and causes, caused and still causes an insecurity. Because, like, you go back to, you know, it's, like, fairly popular in high school. You can ask Rochelle. I promise you I'm not lying. I don't think I have to ask anyone to know that. But I... I, I, was, uh, I, I was a known entity. Uh, <laughs> I was the, uh, the vice president of my senior class. Um, oh, but, okay. but, yeah, huge that. deal. Huge deal. But anyway, going back to... It actually was at the time. To, uh, that, that was a big deal. Okay, back uh, to... It was. <laughs> oh, yeah. You had, like, hang all the poster boards. And it was, like, the year before I lost. And so uh, to come back and win was, uh, was honestly, at that time... A dream come true. All right, wait. So while with it, just just side note, I promise I'll come back. Okay. But side note about dreams was that like I drove past that high school every day with my dad going to the middle school, Sunrise Middle School, and there at the high school, Horizon High School, had this, it was like this giant gray, ugly concrete slab that was like Horizon High School. It was like, just disgusting. And I was like, Dad, like someone should like paint that like green and gold and make it like the school colors, and like it would be so awesome. And he's like, Oh, well, maybe you can do it when you get to school. So like when I became vice president, my pitch to the, to the school was like, hey, like, can we, our senior class gift, make that sign like beautiful. Uh, and it happened and we, that, they like approved it and we like raised the money and, and we ended up buying like tiles because I guess the paint would have gotten destroyed in the sun. And we had all these beautiful green and gold tiles. And so now every time I go back there or drive past it, it's, it says it and it's like class of 04. And I was like, I did that and it's awesome. Um, so that's that. a cool story. So anyway, going back to it, I, I missed school for about four days. It, like it happened, my mom died on a, a Tuesday night and then I missed the rest of that week. And I knew going back, just like word would travel really fast. This is before social media, but still there's choir, there's drama, you know, there's, there's gossip and rumors. And I knew walking back into that school, everyone would look at me differently. It was like this like weird, like how do they treat me now? Is there like a sympathetic thing? Is there like, do we treat him normally? do they know my mom died? Do they, are they going to treat me with kid gloves? Do they not know? So it's like this paranoia, this insecurity of like, now I'm going back to school and I'm different than everyone else. 
and it, it, I mean, it's almost like I, I can imagine, I don't know, but it's like, like, a, like a closeted feeling, you know, of like, I have this like secret and like, who knows? And like, are they talking about me? And like, it just, it causes this very weird thing. And then, you know, there's those moments when everyone's like, Oh, like your mom, you know? And I was like, uh, like actually, uh, you know, and they're like, Oh shit, dude, like, I'm so sorry. And then you're like, no, no, like, it's cool. But then you're like, God damn, like, I want to go cry now. And like, so it's like this weird, like, how do I behave? And it's like, do I be vulnerable? Do I like act depressed? And I think it caused me to like be more gregarious and bubbly and like friendly. Cause I was like, I'm fine. Like, it's all good. Like, I'm all good. Like, you know, it's fine. Like that happened, but like, Hey, like I'm still me. I'm still me. Um, which is like exhausting. And I think yeah. I brought that into much of my adult life. And then I worked with a great uh, acting coach slash mentor and uh he kind of was just like get rid of that like that's a big block like you're just constantly like either like draining yourself or masking how you really feel and like that's gonna hurt you as an actor like you just gotta like if you're down and like you're fucking pissed and you're raging or you're depressed like it is what it is and so when you walk into that house party like just be however you are and like that's what you're supposed to be and like that you attract what you'll attract and like it is what it is but like you don't have to put a show on for everyone. Like, you know, it's, it's like that goodwill hunting thing of like, you know, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. You know, it's not your fault. Like that, that Robin Williams scene of like, you know, I don't have to, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, I don't have to, sorry. People please. Yeah. Uh, kind of like, yeah, just like, I don't have to like make up for something that like I didn't do compensate. wrong. You know, I don't have to compensate. There it is. Thank you very much. Thank you. So yeah. Um, and that was a big, that, that was a big shift that happened, I think. But even, even nowadays, especially nowadays with a baby, I mean, it's like, I just see so many of my friends, I, I, like, for example, you know, we talked about it earlier, but, uh, like, you know, my wife's mom passed away literally the day before he was born, which I think her of the death sent her body into shock and caused him to come a couple weeks early. But it's like, you know, so she had lost, one of the big things we bonded over actually like on our first date we met doing theater we met doing much ado about nothing shakespeare oh my god um at casa vega great mexican place in la we both realized that she had lost her dad when she was 17 and i lost my mom when i was 16 and so that was a huge moment because oh now we both get each other because everything i'm talking about she already inherently knew which is like huge because like i feel like oh you've been through some shit like you know tragedy at that age like we get each other and no one it was like this kind of a secret club you know that you don't want to be in but you're in and so then when her mom died i mean so she now has no parents and my mom is gone and my dad's in arizona and so it's like there's like one grandparent in a different state and so it's like it's really hard you know and like you see like oh, so many of my other friends have like oh like they have like four parents around or like oh the both parents are over and like babysitting and everyone's like healthy and like they have care and, you know babysitters and help and i'm like man, like, that must be really nice, you know, because, like, it's kind of, like, just us out here, and, like, it's really, really hard, and, and, uh, so even that is kind of, like, the constant reminder, and, like, so many things that I'm, like, man, like, I wish my mom could see my son right now, and, like, I wish she could meet his grandma, grandmothers, you know, like, what they would show him, what they would teach him, that he'll never know, so that sucks, you know, and then I feel robbed, too, because I was 17, and I knew my mom as, like, my mom who like makes lunches and dinners and like, you know, signs field trip permission slips and like, you know, supports me and yeah. But like, we didn't really get to talk as like person to person about like, you know, your politics and religion, like dreams, like, you know, get into it that I feel like most people kind of transition into as like an adult. So that sucks too. Cause there's so many things I wish I could ask her daily, you know, or even the fact that like she, you know, maybe she's looking down from somewhere, seeing me do what I'm doing, but who the hell knows? And uh, and that sucks too, because I'm like, man, she'd be like really proud and like too bad I don't get to like share this with her, you know, physically. So a lot of that hurts daily. And it's, you know, there's not a day that goes by when I'm not thinking about her and replaying that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but you know, then the flip side of it, I feel like I do, you, you know, I live for her and like things, things that I do, things I say the way I treat people, the way, you know, I say what you mean, mean what you say, like, you know, carpe diem. It's really because of that, because I, I truly understand that like 
tonight I could go to sleep and not wake up. And so like, I better like tell everyone exactly how I'm feeling and like do what I want to do and like cross everything off the list because I don't know that there's a tomorrow, which could also has its negatives when you're like living like that. You know what I mean? Like, but it's, it's, uh, that's kind of like what I know. I just, I feel like every day could be the last. And so, uh, that's kind of informed who I am. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. And that's really, that's really beautiful that you guys bonded on one of your first dates about these mutual losses, even though it's tragic. It's that's, that's really like cool. It's not the right word, but I'm like, Oh my God, that's so beautiful that you both. It is beautiful. Yeah. That yeah. you find someone who's got like an understanding of it. Um, and, and mm -hmm. also just, you know, just an inherent understanding of, of people of a community that's lost a parent that young. Aren't, weren't you about the same age? Yeah, I was 19 when my dad died of ALS, which is kind of like a cousin of muscular dystrophy, which I know it is. Have other things going on as well. But yeah, I, I'm familiar with muscular dystrophy and paralysis. And then I with ALS, and I'm so sorry. And so, so were you in college? I was, yeah, freshman in college. So we were, yeah, like up, around the same, you know, close in age. And, For sure. Yeah. And did you feel a similar thing? Like, were you like, when you showed up, when everyone knew, was it weird, like a weird, like, oh, I'm different now, but like. I'm not, but I am. Totally. I think, you know, those teenage years are interesting because you don't, you have a lot of perspective. You're, you're close to fully formed, but you're not. So there's this, like a little bit of a barrier between you and the understanding. Whereas like now, if anything were to happen, I would, well, it would be ho horrible as well, but I feel like I would have a little bit more clarity about my boundaries. And at that time, I was kind of just like, I just want to keep going and riding on the momentum so that it's not awkward. I relate to what you're saying about just being like, it's all good. Let's keep doing plays. And I was in a play the night he died. You know, it was like opening night. And I was like, no, I'm good. I'm in. I'm going to do all the plays. Mm -hmm, and like, because mm -hmm. you just like, it's just what you do. But, but also, like you said, that was a great word. Like you just, cause, cause you don't want it to be awkward, yeah. which is so weird. Cause you're like, Hey, like, like I'm the one that's experiencing this like devastating <laughs> loss. Like I'm worried about you feeling awkward now around me. And so it, it, yes, that, that weird compensating for like uh, something that happened to you. It's, it's like a weird, like victim thing that, yeah, you, you know, you still deal with, I still deal with to this day. It's very strange. Well, it's weird that in our culture, we just don't address death in depth or really at all, you know, it's just a taboo topic. It's not something that's like acceptable dinner table conversation. And well, yeah, I don't think it's necessary to dwell in, and be sad all the time. I think if we were to normalize the conversations around death, it would just be less of a thing. Whereas, you know, that's kind of like one of the missions of the podcast. I'm like, why does it have to be so bizarre? I mean, to this day, I'm like, it's like 10 years later. Some people will be like, I'm so sorry. Oh my God, I'm sorry. I asked you, oh my God. And I'm like, it's actually okay. His name was Lloyd. Here's what he was like. It's sad, but it's okay, you know? But other people- I do know, and I think like, because, because I think there's a huge amount of fear around death in the fact that like, you know, it's inevitable, like it's going to happen to you, but you don't know when or how or how long you've got or how it's even going to go down. And hence, you know, the coronavirus panic, which I completely, you know, get and feel. But I think there's like that fear, but like, because what happened to us happened, uh, I think there's like an understanding that fear kind of goes away because, okay, well, like my worst fear happened and like now I'm still here to talk about it and like I understand it now. And so like there is this like veil lifted and like now we can confront it. Um, but I think if it hasn't happened to you, yeah, you kind of want to keep it at bay and like keep that guard up, you know? And the other big thing I learned through, through my mom's passing was like, my God, death is a business. It's like, insane like you know the money for the the services the coffin the you know cre cremations funerals paperwork and just the stress i saw my dad go through like accounts and you know social security and gosh it's like the last thing you want to deal with is all that when you're dealing with the emotional like gravity of that um and so i think that's very important and again like that's a huge thing my wife pushes too which is like life insurance and like you know paperwork like get everything in order and like yeah it sucks to talk about but like it's going to happen and like i'd rather not have to uh you know be at a loss or have even more stress and grief and anxiety on top of what is there emotionally because like it's gonna happen so like what are we doing um and so yeah that's a big thing that i think a lot of people don't uh realize that it's just kind of like that happens and like you wake up the next day and get back to it. And I'm like, no, like there's like weeks of, of like red tape and stuff that you have to go through. And it's like ridiculous, you know, and those calls are just like the most awkward and 
so yeah, a, a, lots of lots of lessons learned with with what happened to us. How is your wife doing? That's a lot that she went through this second loss right before the birth of her son. I'm curious, yeah, how is she feeling and how are you guys able to support each other in this time? Uh, I mean, it was very, very hard uh, for both of us, but especially her at first, because, you know, it's like all she wanted to do was share her child with her mother. Um, and so to not get to do that at all is just heartbreaking. And, you know, things keep coming up, you know, like, Holiday Mother's Day and you know July Fourth and the Emmys like you know we all used to get together and they talk about the dresses and the red carpet and who we think is gonna win and have champagne and the whole thing and it's like well I guess that's not happening you know so it's like everything is a constant reminder um, so it's still tough but again I think the fact that we've both been through it before that I you know I, I can understand it that we talk about it and it's it's nothing like hidden or swept under the rug like you know we 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 speak about how we feel and you know if she's having a rough day then I just step up and you know do whatever I can do to help her and take care of the baby more and vice versa um and I think it's just communication uh right now she's doing really well like honestly honestly like the strongest woman I've ever seen because the fact that she had to deal with that with her mom and then give birth like within 24 hours I was like fuck you are a warrior rough as it was uh we're getting back to you know some sense of 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 normalcy and routine now as much as one can um and and she's back she's like you know working from home and and we just kind of split up our time with you know what she has to do what i have to do watching the baby and you know again very very limited help because uh no one's really here and there's a virus so it's not like we can just have people over and we're like freaked out about daycare and you know all we just there's so many unknowns and so is it easy? No, but I think, I think communication is, is a hundred percent, you know, the key to, uh, to making it work and just letting like, I'm like, listen, I need like an hour to go like just for a drive and like to breathe and like get away. Like, otherwise, like, this is like, I'm going to like snap, you know? And she's like, okay, like, cool. Like go do it. And then same thing. You know, she's like, Hey, like I need to sleep. Like now nah, like, I'm, I'm like done. Like, can you just like watch it, you know, watch Dylan? And I was like, yeah, of course. Um, so it's just, it's that it's like, just, just telling, you know, telling each other where we're at. Um, so that we can help each other because marriage. <laughs> because hashtag marriage. Hashtag um, marriage. Yeah. How wait, how old is Dylan now? Uh, he'll be six months next week. Wow. A week from uh, today, actually. He'll be six months. I know. It's crazy. Feels like six months, but then sometimes it feels like just yesterday. And sometimes it's like 40 years. Like I, it's all out of whack, but um, he's doing well and he's adorable and he's healthy and just makes us smile and laugh every day. And it's beautiful that's the thing too we're like oh my gosh like what kind of a parent am i gonna be and there's like all the fears that come with that and like you know am i gonna love him like i see other parents love their babies but like it all just happens the way it's supposed to and it's all just beautiful and it's like it's truly like like i love you i've never experienced i couldn't imagine it like i really you know it's one of those things like oh you don't know until you're a parent but like you don't like it's like it's all the all the emotions um but it def- i just feel a lot more uh full now um because because uh because of him and it really is beautiful so yeah oh that's so nice to hear seeing my friends that have had babies specifically this year in quarantine it's it's so special and i'm like your son is a quarantined baby through and through like 2020 baby i mean Actually, what- rochelle was the one she was she said that one of the best lines she was like what a cool origin story <laughs> i was like just <laughs> definitely you grow up quick but yeah i'm curious your perspective on grief and comedy and the intersection of the awkward or lighter moments around grief. So a question I like to ask is, is there something particularly funny or awkward or unique about your grief story that comes to mind? I feel like so often grief conversations are so heavy and you're such like a bubbly, gregarious guy. Is there anything that comes to mind about your grief that was funny or weird? I mean, the, the only thing that like just popped it in my head, uh, which I think it only made the biggest impression because it was like the first time it happened was what I kind of alluded to earlier with like the, your mom jokes, because I remember, you know, there's like a, like a group of guys and I'm still very close with, but it was like, you know, back in the choir days and we're hanging out and it was, you know, just that stupid, like, I said something about like, oh, like, you know, what about that infrared light or whatever? And he was like, your mom's an infrared light. And I was like, well, my mom died. And everyone got like real fucking weird. And he like to this day still apologizes, but we're still, we're still, you know, close friends. But uh, I thought, you know, that was weird and like, I, like, fun, like, like that is funny. 
but I'm like, but I can't like, but like, oh, if I laugh, like, am I insensitive and am I weird? But like, it's funny and like, it's funny that he feels bad, but like, you know, it, it's one of those weird, weird, like all the emotions are like in that one sentence. But uh, to your point about, you know, the comedy of it, I think we, we, we have to laugh at it in order to like, in order to cope and in order to like understand and in order to bond. And I find that even with a lot of, you know, art in general, like, you know, movies, TV shows, like those things that are like kind of like inappropriate, but like you can laugh at it. It's like, it's just like this great equalizer. I feel like when like, it's like if the whole audience is laughing together, it's like, okay, we can handle like a very uh, sensitive issue and a sensitive topic because like, hey, you're laughing and I'm laughing. Like for, we're connected over what we're seeing. And like, there's like a release, you know, like there's something, it's all pent up in your body and laughing kind of helps get it out. And there, that's, you know, I don't want to get into the whole thing with, you know, political correctness and cancel culture. And there's a whole other kind of podcast, but I mean, there is a worry of mine of like, you know, what, when does like the laughing stop? And like, what can we say anymore without like losing your entire livelihood and career when you're like, it's just kind of like a coping mechanism, I feel like for so many people, not that offensive and inappropriate things are okay. But I think if like, if it helps you get by and like, you're able to laugh at your own circumstance and something that happened to you, then I feel like then you should be the one to decide if it's funny because like it's your life and like it's your parent and it's your, you know, your circumstance. And if you don't find it funny, fine. Okay, here's another story that, that I just thought of was when, so we did, we cremated my mom and years later, like my dad, brother and me all went to like drive up to this, this mountain in Arizona where like she just loved and we could see it from her backyard and we'd hike it and we had like the bag of uh you know ashes and my dad like wanted to document it and had the camera and he was just like okay like on three say bye bye mommy and we were like we just like died laughing died laughing uh but we burst out laughing because it was just such like just a random like just such an obscure like surreal like is this really happening like are three of us on some mountaintop like saying bye bye and we threw the ashes and they all came back at us with like the wind and it was like it was this moment like the three of us just kind of like cracked up like crying laughing but like it was the most cathartic therapeutic like bonding thing that could have happened as if like she was there like wanting us to like laugh together as a family and like be okay and so i guess personally my experience is that like laughter is the best medicine and it's helped us bond because we all know it hurts and we've cried and it sucks and we know that like that's inherent of course like we're wrecked so like we can live in that or we can like we can try to like laugh and like know that there is life to be led and we do it for her and she would want us to be happy and and you know and not stay in that darkness so um personally i think comedy is essential thanks for sharing that and and i can imagine i can just picture that you're like well say goodbye you know what else are you gonna say like say cheese like no right like, we're saying yeah, the goodbye one is, so. i'm like oh my gosh like you just said that right <laughs> it was just a very like whoa like this is happening like this is this is this is real you know but it's, yeah i think the laughter kind of like has like that the, the levity of the moment that was needed so it wasn't as dark as you know you think it's going to be when you talk about spreading someone's ashes it's so surreal that there's so many people with two parents just on this earth and that will have them for such a long time and sometimes i think about that i'm like wow some people are going to have their parents their whole life and some people just aren't and it's interesting that we're all just existing in this world with such different experiences but i think a lot more people lose a parent than they think but when it's you it, it feels like it's only you because it's uncommon enough that it's not like all your buddies but it's common enough that somehow there's we're sprinkled around this earth together like it is happening well and i think i mean again for uh, for for me personally i know there was you know there wasn't that social media connection like you know like your 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 click your crew was kind of like who was around and I was definitely and I think at that age you know teenagers like you're kind of like the first of your posse you know to have that happen and so it is weird we're like oh yeah people's parents die but like not this young like this is really weird and like this is this is not how it's supposed to happen you know so yeah I, I I agree with you but again I think just you know life lesson it's everyone's like like you said where you're like it's happening to me and it's like my story and my perspective 
I think like that's everyone's situation with everything. That's everyone's yeah. circumstance, you know, is that like all, all people can really know is what's happening and what's happened to them personally. Um, so yeah, I, but there is that weirdness of like, even nowadays, there's people that are like, you know, 35, 40 and they're like, oh my gosh, like, you know, my mom and, you know, she's in the hospital and there's like, like the first instinct is like, yeah, like that's obviously terrible and tragic, but I'm like, well, that's pretty nice. You got her till 35, yeah. huh? You know, but I'm like, I don't want to say that reaction. because like, yeah. Cause then you're like, well, no, like, cause there you go. Like, I can't even joke about that because like, well, I'm the asshole because like they're going through it right now. I'm like, they're going through what I went, you know, went through well, 20 years ago. So is a hard one for me when they're like, yeah, it's like 33, they're like 33. And then they're like, Oh, I'm so devastated on the floor crying about like my grandmother. And it like, of course that's sad for any death, but it's like my grandparents also died when I was in high school. And that was like, not even my main story. That was like the least of my problems. Like it, sadly, I was like also a lot of other things. And yeah, so I and have it's that like the biggest thing is like a footnote. And you're like, no, no, like that was like, that this is your biggest thing though. Like I've been there, done that. And so, yeah. but again, it's, that's all you know. And but and but the the perspective of that is like, but yeah, like, come on, you're 35. Like they saw they saw you like have kids. They saw you get the house. They saw you do your job. I was like, my mom doesn't even like know who I am as like a man, you know. But you can't understand that unless you've been there. So that's why it's great talking to you. You know, that's why I've you know married the woman I married. Like there there's just there's that inherent thing of like there's uh, your whole perspective of the whole world uh is is shifted and you won't really understand it unless it happened to you you know at that age mm -hmm. and then there's the other side of it where like i'm like well, well lucky that we haven't lost you know both and we didn't lose yep. the, you know we weren't i wasn't in you know foster care or orphaned and like i did have you know a very loving mother up until she left and i have this awesome fucking dad who like stepped up and just like his whole mission was like just keep the wheels rolling and like let's not like shatter the whole family like i'll you know he's he just great example of like just how to like step up and he like became like both parents um like overnight and it was awe inspiring so there's that side of it too where i'm like okay like it, you know it's like it could have been worse even though like that is yes. the worst thing so there's just you know so many things that it's such a sensitive issue i think for so many people so it's like all all i can do is just be honest about my own experience and my own thoughts because who's to tell me that it's wrong you know Mm hmm Well, Preach. I'm going to tell you, it is right, Max. <laughs> Amen, is... sister. Amen. Preach. Yes. Yeah. And I'm laughing at the, uh, the, you, your mom joke. I mean, that just, yeah, I totally, that's like, feels like a different time now, but like the, your mom jokes and like, I well, get it was like it Napoleon with... Dynamite, remember? It was like, your mom goes to college, you know? It was like, so it became everything. It was like, your mom has homework tonight. You know, it was like, what? Like, didn't even, it didn't even make sense, you know, like, you know, but it was just like a thing that we did uh, because, yeah. They're really like, is. your mom didn't do this. And you're like, yeah, she actually didn't. She, she did not survive and <laughs> right. she did not do that. Right. I know. But then you're like, oh, I don't want to make you feel bad. But then you're like, but now, like, now you made me feel bad. And so it gets this weird, like, again, compensating so that they don't feel awkward about your tragedy. It's, it is weird. And I get that with like, you know, girls make a lot of like, you know, d daddy issues, like daddy issues is the name of a podcast, a show of, of, of books of a million things. And people will be like, haha, like daddy issues. I was like, hmm, yeah, it's weird. I'm not like, oh my God, my dad issues. But I'm like, oh, I probably do have those. So the flip side of like, instead of like, oh, your mom or dad issues, I feel like there's the other side when people are trying to be nice of like, oh, like, is your dad going to walk you down the aisle? You know, and you're like, uh, you know, or like with me, we're like, you know, I've done interviews where they're like, is your mom just so proud? <gasps> and you're like, um, I don't know. What did What do you say when that? I do. I say that. I'm like, I'm like, uh, she's, she died. Like she's passed away. So I hope she would be, you know. But I don't know. I am not able to talk to her about it. Um, and they're like, oh, I'm saying you know, it kind of brings the whole thing down, which is like what I didn't want to do. But I'm like, well, what am I going to say? Like, yeah, she's 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 like really like what the fuck? What am I going to do? So, uh, but but yeah, there's there's that assumption that like oh, you must have both parents because like, you're like, you know, young enough. Um, right. And so, yeah. So then again, it makes you feel like you're this outsider outcast, like what's wrong with me? You know, like everyone just looks at me and assumes this, but like, actually, you know, I'm dealing with, with that. There's like shame associated with it, you know, and guilt and awkwardness. And it's just, it's all, it's all the things that you never think you're going to have to deal with um, at that age, but you do. Curious question for you. I did not probably should, should have, and still should, 
but see like a therapist uh, and talk to someone about it. Did you ever? Good question. Um, I did not at the time of my dad's death. I did not see anyone for six years. And then several years ago now when my mom was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer, um, I it just changed my perspective on talking to someone and grief was readdressed. Um, her specific cancer is treatable but not curable, so she'll have it the rest of her life. And when it was a few years ago, it was devastating because, you know, with the diagnosis like that, it was like maybe six months. Yeah, stage months. four I is just... like the last thing you want to hear. Yeah, of course. But or cancer in general, yeah. We're here four years later, and so now it's like the new normal of now I'm used to it and now I'm like good again. But I've on and off for years. I'm talking to someone now, and just because – good to have that relationship if something is to happen to her but it was interesting the the wound was reopened with another diagnosis which is you know everyone has a different situation is it something that you would ever do at some point having like a someone to talk to about your grief it sounds like you're doing oh yeah well but i'm yeah curious your perspective i don't know i think i'm afraid of going and what it would open up or unlock you know that's the truth i i think i'd I'd actually enjoy it i mean even like this is like you know part therapy right now which is just talking about it and having someone listen to your shit you know like genuinely um i think is is nice and i guess i haven't done it because i'm like man there's like 20 years to unpack and like i don't even like i'm like i'm feeling pretty good right now so like let's just kind of like keep what's under the rug under the rug and like keep on chugging forward but then there's like the like, wow, like I wonder what would be like unleashed if I like dealt with all that and like who I would be. Um, but I, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm just not ready or I haven't taken that step yet. But it's something I think is really awesome. And, I, you know, people that do it uh, speak highly of it and I admire it and I probably should and I probably will. But um, but I haven't. Am I allowed to ask you a question or is this all about me? No, I I'm mean, can you can. I, I want it to be about you for your sake, but sure. It'll be, <laughs> no, but like, but like how I'm just curious now. Like for like when you talk about the humor of, of death, like you know we joke about that all the time with with my dad. Like to, you know to this day he'll say things like remember these things when I'm gone. You'll remember the you know it's like there's like this like, inherent like he's going to die. We know that and like that's really going to be devastating because then we're going to have no, me and my brother will have you know no parents and so it's always like this like is this the last time I'm going to see him? Is this the last time I'm going to hug him? Is this the last time I'm going to say I love you? And like to this day, we still, we make it a point now that like we always end phone calls with like, I love you. Cause it's like, we want that to be like the last thing we said in case anything happens. And like, we know how true that can be. So I'm curious, like how that is with you and your mom of like, now that you've both been through that and now she's got stage four, is it something where it's like off limits? So like you guys like just talk about it and like, well, this is crazy. Like now you too, like, is it like a weird thing? you know, or like, does she deal with it differently than you? And like, this is why you're dealing with it the way you are because she doesn't like, I'm fascinated by all that. All the things um, you're so insightful <laughs> to ask. So I, I really appreciate it though. No, thank you. It's like nice of you to ask. Um, yeah, no, like my family was super, super, I have a younger sister and who's in law school. How much younger? Uh, she's two years younger. She's in Columbia Law School on Zoom, which I'm like, what does that even mean? Like it means, I know, well, my, my brother is six years younger than me, but like, yeah, there's like friends that go to NYU, but they, instead of putting their rent into a New York apartment, they all just like got a house in Hawaii and they're attending NYU, but like in Hawaii. And I was like, what is, go like, are there going to be campuses anymore? Like what even is going to college? Like you can just be anywhere. But anyway, sorry, back to you. Anyways, it's so interesting, but you know, my family was like super quiet about all of it and so quiet to the point of it literally exploded out of me. And then when I started doing stand up, like my sets are actually like, I just heavily address death and like I make tons of jokes about it and specifically instigated by my mom's diagnosis of like also my dad's diagnosis like he had ALS from when I was four to 19 so it was like always on our minds he was always sick he was paralyzed he was this I called you know just it was in my mom had breast cancer then too so without going that's a whole other podcast but like when she was diagnosed again and they're like you'll have this forever and my dad had his thing forever I was like something inside of me is just called to do something and here came the podcast stand up because I was like I'm just weirdly surrounded by these diagnoses um it's been a learning curve for me like wanting to be more inclusive to people who've lost people from suicide homicide accidents other things so like, that's you know newer for me but no my mom was very closed off and over the years has seen my openness and at first she was like oh my god what 
the hell yeah. are you doing? And now it's like, you know, she's not like a comedian. She doesn't want to be like open like me, but like she was on the podcast. The fact that she even like talked about that at all. And like I threw in a BuzzFeed video where she's like, this is so awkward. She didn't post it, but like she was in it opening the can of worms. And now she can like make some jokes. She'll be like, oh yeah, well like just use my you know, use just like use my shoes or like buy this with my card because my money's your money because I'll die in a few years. And I'm like, this yeah, isn't... my dad says the same thing. Does he really? Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's not funny, but it's funny, right? Well, because it's like we've, yeah, we've been there. Like we were all on the same page and, and we get it. And, but it's also like, yeah, they're, they're a different generation. So I feel like there is more of like a, like, you know, the closed off nature is the natural nature and people like, just announcing their whole lives on social media for thousands right. of strangers is like so bizarre. Right. Um, but also interesting to you that you had that, you know, your dad was going through that since you were four, which is like, so you've always, I feel like like my outcast, like, Oh, I'm different than everyone thing that hit when I was 17. I wonder like, that's like, that seems like you, you probably grew up with that your whole life and people come over or like they see your dad or it's like, yeah, it's, that's a, that's definitely informed. I, I totally get now, you know, why you're doing the podcast and yeah, why I mean so much. Cause yeah, it's like your whole, your whole upbringing has been like, I'm sure different than, uh, than most with healthy parents. So I know we're popping back and forth between like career and grief and these are my two favorite topics. So for anyone who doesn't know, if you don't mind speaking to your favorite onset experience and also would love to hear about what's coming up for you, the new film you were a part of, it's 2020, you don't know what's next, but like we want to hear what your goals are. Summarize the Max Adler tip. Max Adler tip. Um. Well, Glee was the big, the big thing. That was the big break uh, that got me out of the restaurant game um glee was huge because i did show choir in high school and i also loved nip tuck uh which is ryan murphy's show and so when i found out ryan murphy was doing a show about high school show choir i flipped out and was just like oh my gosh i need to be on that i tried to go in for you know one of their series regulars they wouldn't see me because i didn't have any credits um and ended up getting in as you know a bully who throws a slushie and it was like two lines one day of work and i was like fine i'll take it and then I don't know what happened, but I just... That's all it was at first? <gasps> oh, yeah. It was a co-star. It was like, it was just a two-line... Well, it was like, you know, it was like a monologue because I slushied um, Corey Monteith, rest in peace. Great guy who like welcomed me onto that set and like would just open his arms and was such a leader on and off set and was awesome. And uh, I miss that guy a lot. So, but he, uh, but I, I had like a monologue where like I slushy him and Diana Agron and... Um, and so, but I was with the acting coach mentor who I mentioned earlier, like we coached on it for two hours because I wanted it so bad. And I was like, listen, like, what can I bring into this monologue that nobody else will? Like, let's really understand like the subtext and where this guy, like, why is he bullying? Like, where is this coming from? And we like dug in. And then when I went into the audition, um, they told me like in the Robert? room. Oh yeah. And that's a whole other story because that was like, when I first moved here, I like one of my things was like, I looked up like IMDB and was like, what shows do I like? What movies do I like? Who casts them? And like, I want to be on their radar. And I would just like yeah. go drop off headshots, like, you know, and all like little drop off bins, like at their doors and UDK casting Robert, Robert Ulrich, who you obviously know, um, was one of the big ones because of Nip Tuck. And I was like, man, like I hope one day, like they have an audition and like, I can, I can go in there and impress them. And I, and I went in there and, uh, and there was like, there was like people I knew, like guys from like O-Town were like auditioning before me. I remember like, it was like Ashley Angel or like it was just people. I was like, oh my God, like I saw that guy on like a Disney movie when I was seven, like what the hell? But I went in there and did my thing. And, and Robert in the room was just like, I think you're the guy for this. And I was like, what? Like no one's ever told me that in the room. And yeah, he was, you know, with Alex, his uh, amazing uh, assistant at the time. I was their intern in 2010. So I love oh, so them. like a year later. Yeah, I love them so much. As people, we're still friends. We still text and hang out, and uh, and then they gave me that you know big job. So that was how that happened, and then, and then it was just a yeah. one day thing. Thank you so much. Uh, and then yeah, Ryan, you know Ryan's on set, and I was just like, oh my god, sir, like Nip Talk is like crazy. This is nuts, and made a fool of myself. But um, it became another episode, and then another episode, and then six years, and it began. I was never a regular. I never had a contract. They never even talked to me about anything that would it was just like a script would like show up and i would find out i'm booked for another episode and i was like whoa this is like a big storyline 
and I would like come in and there's just like business as usual. Like, Hey Max. I was like, Hey, hey like you, you wrote this like really impactful storyline for me. Like, do you want to talk about it? Like, no, no, just break a leg. Have fun. I was like, okay. Like shit. I hope they trust me. Anyway. So Glee, that was the big one. Um, and I, there, there was a, I won't say any names. There, there was a producer there who like was always kind of just cold to me. Like I always felt like I needed to like prove myself to him. And um, that was a big moment on set because there was the episode where I kissed Chris Colfer in the locker room um, where like, you find out Karofsky's uh, closeted. Um, and that producer was at the rehearsal watching and we did it and he came up to me and he was just like, this is gonna be a magical scene, great job. And like shook my hand and I was like, whoa, like, okay. Like got the approval of like the king, you know? Um, so that was a big moment. Uh, so that was really, yeah, that was, that was huge. And then uh, Switch to Birth was the thing after that, which, which again was like, I think a couple episodes, just like recur for like two or three episodes, it became three seasons. They, they just, they liked my, the chemistry with Vanessa Morano, who's an amazing actress and just what I was, what I brought to the set. And that became three years. And so that was, it's always been like this weird, like backdoor, um, you know, kind of like approach to getting roles. Like I've never like booked a huge, huge gig on just like an audition. It's always been this weird, like I get something and then it just kind of like domino effects. So that's crazy. Um, then there was a Woody Allen movie that I booked and did called Cafe Society, but it was weird because I booked it and shot it and it was with Bruce Willis. So my scenes was all with Bruce and Woody. And then like days later, Bruce was like, let go from the project because of a Broadway scheduling conflict and replaced with Steve Carell. And I was just like, huh, that's interesting. And then when they wanted me to reshoot with Steve Carell, in between that time, I had booked Sully with Clint Eastwood. And so I was gonna be in New York filming with Clint Eastwood doing Sully the day that like Woody needed me in LA with Steve Carell. And so I literally had to drop out of a Woody Allen project because I was like, sorry, I'm working with Clint in New York. Um, and that was- Oh my God. Like devastating, but also like kind of cool. But also like, like my dad, you know, was like the first one that was like, you're unemployed 300 days a year. Like the one day, you know, they, they, they need you on the same day. And I was like, I know dad, like this is crazy. Like, what am I going to do? Um, so I, I got to work with Woody, but um, you know, never made it to camera because it was a different actor. But then yeah, Clint Eastwood and Tom Hanks, like those were great moments because our, like, we would like hang out in like the first class section of like the plane we were shooting on. And it was just like, I was just sitting there and like, we're just talking shop and talking politics and talking about, you know, movies and horses and Westerns. And I was like, you're just sitting there with like these legends, just talking to them about real life stuff. And just every second is surreal. So that was nuts. And then the most recent thing, which, yeah, so com coming out October 16th on Netflix is Aaron Sorkin wrote and directed The Trial of the Chicago Seven which is based on these true events of protesters and police getting into it, clashing in 1968 over the Vietnam War, which could not be more relevant and topical now. Um, and that was nuts because we shot in Chicago, like on the streets and at the park where it actually happened 50 years ago. And it's, you know, Eddie Redmayne, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Frank Langella, Michael Keaton, like the list goes on and Mark Rylance, like there's so many great actors. Um, and we're there, you know, with hundreds of, of background in, you know, the period piece clothing and period piece cop cars and it just, it, you felt like you were in 1968 and like the whole city felt like a period piece and just one of those like, how am I here right now moments. And so, yeah, those are all, those have been some pretty cool. So yeah, so all, all the moments like this morning where I'm auditioning for like two pages on some show and I'm like, what the hell? You know, there are those moments uh, that cancel it out, but um, those are few and far between, I'll say, but when it happens, I really appreciate it. And it's very, very like, it's so sweet, you know, because there's all the other shit moments when you're like, I am just gonna like, everyone's like, wanna go back to your trailer? And I'm like, nope, I'm gonna sit right here and just like watch everything and take it all in because like, <laughs> I probably won't be back for like four months, you know? Um, so yeah, those are the big, those are the big moments that I can remember. Oh, congratulations, Max. I'm like beaming this entire time because it's just it's just so cool when people that are as nice and like kind and charismatic as you get to 
live their dreams and you know you weren't like born in x y or z like you made this happen and I'm just so so excited to hear about it right now and congratulations I hope you're really proud of yourself because that's a really really big deal and that's really really amazing thank you I appreciate that very much and uh, you know the full circle uh closing moment would just be like you know I hope it makes mom proud you know it's it's that that feeling of like all those moments like and I think about her when I'm on set I'm like all right mom you know let's go do this so um yeah do you just love your life sometimes like are you just so proud of yourself I just feel like that just must be so just cool you know as someone like who hasn't done all of those things you know a couple things but not all of them I just do you just feel like so excited I would just wake up and be like oh my god and I mean yeah I guess the only thing I can say is just that like if it happened to me, then it's possible for anyone. Cause like, yeah, it is just, I'm just some dude from Arizona who like moved out here and like didn't know what the hell he was doing and been fired. And, you know, so it's all those moments, like all the grief and, you know, shit leading up to it. Um, I guess I can just say, you know, it's obviously possible for anyone and it's just hard work and timing and luck and opportunity and all that. But um, it, it has, it has happened, uh, you know, to, to me several times and I'm very, very, uh fortunate and and grateful and appreciative and uh it's not lost on me for a second oh i love that thank you max for sharing all of this and last question for you do you have a book film or podcast that inspired you in some way relating to your grief or relating to your career wow well book catcher in the rye I, I just, I love it. And I feel like I can read that every few years. Movie, weirdly enough, uh, The Firm, which is like a Tom Cruise film from back in the day, because I remember that was like the first movie I remember seeing in the theater with my dad. I'm thinking like, man, I want to do that. Like, I think, I think I want to be an actor. And uh, what was the, what was the book, movie, and what else? Oh, podcast. Just, There's a great, um, yeah. uh, in addition to yours, in addition to Dying of Laughter, Thanks. there's one that I listened to called um, Off Camera with Sam Jones. Yes. Yeah. And I love that he gets really into it with actors that I really love and admire, you know, all the, all the A-listers um, who have had success and kind of talks like this, you know, their, their upbringing and their story and, you know, grief and tragedy and what's led them to where they're at now. And I always find kind of, you know, solace and community in, in that podcast as well. So there you go. Love the Rex. Love it all. How do you handle the heartbreak of the biz and this is just like a personal question or like as someone who's been through tragedy in your real life curious if you've had tools or things to help you through heartbreak of like getting really close to stuff like I've tested for a few things and and yet since I I have a hard time there's things from years ago that I still wish I got and how do you handle the heartbreak of getting close to roles I mean, to be honest with you, I've actually never even tested in my life. I've never been a series regular. Uh, it's, it's, it's always been this weird, like, oh, like he got on as a guest star and like, oh, okay, like he's good. Let's write more for him. But like, I, I guess I'm just not a great auditioner. Like I'm still, you know, like auditioning for stuff these days and like not booking and like it still crushes me. So I'm, I'm with you to this day. Um, but I think it's a really honestly, full circle goes back to my mom because there's that thought of like, I understand true loss and true heartbreak. And like you said earlier, you know, like, like, like it could be worse. So it's like, when I don't get that audition or that job, like it sucks, but it's like, I'm alive, I'm breathing. I don't have a disease, you know, right. That I know of, you know, and I, I think it's that it's like, no matter what people say about it, you know, me or my work, or if I don't get a job, it's like, well, but my heart's beating there'll there'll be another day and like we'll figure it out like it's really not the end of the world because like I've experienced what I thought the end of the world would be and I have came out of that and I've lived to see you know future days beyond that so like if that didn't break me then like not getting that gig on the CW sure won't you know that kind of a thing granted it's hard like it's just tough because you just want to win and you want someone that tells you like hey like you're talented and validate that dream and uh it's something I still you know still have to deal with to this day and in a really kind of like a different way you know because now there's like either fans or friends or people that like you know, think I'm like some millionaire living in the hills and like definitely not near that. And uh, 
you know, they're like, oh, but you like you're in, like you you work all the time, and I'm like, no, like Sorkin was like last October, and like I did like a day on the rookie, and like I haven't worked this whole year, and like I got a family, like so there's still that stress too of like there's like the assumption the world kind of puts on you, and then the reality, you know what I mean? It's like yeah, you Google my net worth, it is uh you know a lot more than what I've got in the account. There's still things I struggle with and deal with, but I mean I th I think it's that I think it's like, you know, at the end of the day, there's like shelter over my head there's food there's health there's family um and so i think there's like the knowing that there's tomorrow and there's another job that is more right for me or that i, I just don't know about yet and like every day there's a new opportunity and something comes up that i had no idea was going to happen yesterday like even going back to this audition today it was like friday night at like 7 30 i think my, my wife and i were watching ratchet on netflix and it was like at 8 30 i got this audition and i was like man like i just like checked out for the weekend and i was like so excited just to like chill yeah like boom like back to work so it's like every day every night every hour like anything is possible anything can happen and so i think that's what kind of like keeps me going is like is the excitement of, of of the unknown of like well like tomorrow is promised to nobody life and death wise but also career wise so i think there's that of like there's the, the hope uh, kind of outweighs the devastation. I love that. Thank you for that. You have, you have such a positive, you have such a positive attitude and like outlook on life. Like you're just such a lovely person to talk with. Like I feel very energized with this conversation. So thanks for sharing like, the vulnerabilities, the excitement. Like I'm here for it, Max. I feel oh, really great. I'm so glad. To. Thank you. Yeah. And feeling so mutual. I'm glad you're doing this. I think it's going to help a lot of people reach a lot of people, um, help a lot of people get through everything they're going through. So Thank you and good luck to you and your mom and sister and family and boyfriend and everything and uh, in life and love and career and all that jazz. I mean, look at that wrap up. I couldn't have done it better myself. <laughs> Where can people find you on social media though before I let you go? Mr. Underscore Max underscore Adler. Twitter and Instagram, which I'll have to talk to you about how to share this or how to let people know um, or when. Totally. Yay, that's, I, that's so appreciated that. Thank you. Check and check. I mean, I feel like a lot of people I mean, they know who you are, but now I hope this, they can learn more about your personal story and I hope that's helpful to them. So thank you. I thank hope you. so. That's the reason for doing this is I, I really hope that this podcast and our conversation can help, even if it just helps one other person, uh, especially, if, you know, not hurting themselves, then, uh, then mission accomplished. We've, we've done good. Thanks, Max.